welcome to episode 208 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. Jennifer in North Carolina was very kind to reach out to the podcast with a very sweet email, and I asked if I could share it with you today. Jennifer wrote, Hi, Amy. I can't believe it took me this long to find this podcast. I have been listening for several months now. The ideas shared through your podcast have made a huge impact on me professionally, especially as I've transferred to a new school and a district back in October. Thank you for finding the experts and asking all the right questions. Having switched from a large urban district with two library directors to a small rural district without a dedicated library director, I would have felt the impact of less support much more if it weren't for your podcast. On a side note, I've been going through your back catalog and I saw that you had interviewed Heather Morfield Lang, my former professor. And then friends, Jennifer did something really fantastic, which is she suggested some topics which we could uh, feature on the podcast, and even better yet, some colleagues who would be fantastic to interview. Jennifer ends her email with, again, thank you for the important work you are doing and making school librarians feel less alone. Most sincerely, Jennifer in North Carolina. Friends, I'd also like to extend a very special welcome this week to listener Barbara in Quebec and also six wonderful school librarians who are going to be joining us for an upcoming episode and listener request, Circulation Software, Experts Chime In, Madison in Australia, Harry in Michigan, Steve in New Jersey, Blake in Tennessee, Wendy in Texas, and Carolyn in Virginia. Friends, I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Friends, if you tuned in last week, you heard uh, my invitation to send a question to New Zealand because my friend Penny Walsh is going to be interviewing me in an upcoming episode this spring. Penny Walsh is a former uh, guest on this show. She's been in episode 93, uh, as well as episode 145, round one, Can I Just Vent? And, you know, this is really a case of library Twitter at its best because Penny and I regularly exchange emails and messages on Twitter. And and she had this idea. She said, why doesn't somebody interview you? And I said, well, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, the, the one thing I ask is that I don't see the questions in advance because you know, I'd like to sort of turn those tables and, and, uh, and Penny's going to ask the question. So friends, if you have a question that you would like to have asked on this episode, by all means, uh, I've included Penny's uh, contact information in the show notes. You can either email her or her Twitter handle is also listed there as well. And now a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database. Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. And now in a segment I like to call Why I Love Capstone. Friends, I have gushed about Capstone's series called You Choose. And this goes back to when I was a kid and I read the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Well, in this case, these have been completely updated for today's readers with glossy images and bright, vibrant pictures and wonderfully creative and engaging interactive stories. In this case, this series, there are eight in this set called You Choose Monster. Hunter. I've included a link in the show notes. And this is really fun because it is obviously uh, fiction. And in this case, our readers and 
typically between grades, uh, sort of reading level of a uh, third grade, fourth grade, and uh, interest level between third grade and the seventh grade. I these books flew off the shelf, and I always bought them in sets, and I always kept them sort of displayed in sets because the Choose Your Own Adventure uh, series is really sort of fun. And once you sort of capture your students' interest, they keep on coming back for more, and they want to read all the books in the series. And I will tell you what these are a great cure for. If you are tired of students returning books, and it is very obvious that they probably read about five pages and gave up on the book. That is never going to happen with the You Choose books because in, you know, all of these books, there are many endings and many, many more choices. And in this case, they even tell you on the front of the book, how many sort of endings you have and how many choices you have. And therefore, you know, your kids get five pages into the story and they're going to be given choices. And all of a sudden, in some cases, you know, they meet a grisly end. And so they want to go back and they want to make sure that they survive this next time. And of course, it's all age appropriate. I'll read the description on the website. An action-packed series in the ever popular You Choose brand, where you learn about the world's most elusive mythological creatures, including Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Kraken, and more. Full of life or death decisions, The series of interactive books puts you smack dab in the center of the action. Each choice brings you one step closer to becoming an epic monster hunter or an epic failure, complete with real-life landmarks, nonfiction back matter, and dozens of possible outcomes. The adventure never ends with you choose Monster Hunter. There are eight books in this series, including Can You Capture the Chupacabra? Can You Capture the Swamp Monster? Can You Catch the Kraken? Can You Discover the Alien? Can You Find the Jersey Devil? Can You Nab the Mothman? Can You Net the Loch Ness Monster? Can You Track Down Bigfoot? And again, friends, these are really fun because when you look at the covers, it's going to tell your readers how many different choices they're going to be able to make, as well as, you know, how many different endings they might have. So in this case, Can You Track Down Bigfoot has 41 choices and 20 different endings, something that will keep your readers engaged and reading a book so that they can, you know, try all the different endings. I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode, Empowering Elementary Students and my conversation with Ben Court. Friends, I'm so excited. Ben Court, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for being here. I'm, I'm excited to chat today. You know, friends, I have been so excited about having this conversation. Ben and I were in a group chat oh, back in November, and all of a sudden I started cyber stalking him and realizing that this was a talent that we needed to harness for the podcast. You know, friends, you're going to realize very quickly the expertise that he brings to the conversation. Ben, would you describe for us where in the country you are? Tell us about your current library. What kinds of of programs you offer, the students you support. Uh, give us some context. Sure. So uh, like she said, my name is Ben Court. I am an elementary school teacher librarian in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, that is Washington State. Uh, basically, I'm in Portland. Uh, I could be at the Portland Airport in 10 minutes if I hopped in my car and drove. Uh, so we are a suburb of Portland, but technically on the Washington side of things. We are a uh, K-5 elementary. Actually, we're a pre school through fifth grade elementary school. Um, We usually have around 400, 450 kids. We're halfway through a reboundering because they're building some no school. So currently we're at about uh, 300. Um, We're pretty tiny right now. We are about 70% or so free and reduced lunch. So definitely plenty of kids uh, who need a lot of, of extra supports here. Uh, In terms of my job and what library looks like in my school, in my district, uh, I get every class in the building uh, one time a week for about 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, It's great. It means I get to know every single kid. 
it means I get to ensure that every kid uh, gets uh, connected to books every single week, which is awesome. Uh, on top of that, uh, in kind of the other half of my job, I do just a whole lot of random things. Uh, I run a daily makerspace for my third, fourth, and fifth grade uh, students. I do kind of specific targeted makerspace activities for second graders, kind of to introduce them to the idea of makerspace and some of the cool things that the makerspace has to offer. We do a rolling makerspace cart for our kindergarten and first grade kiddos. Um, so every kid in the school gets makerspace in some way, shape or form, which is which is great. Um, I also do a lot of work with our school district. I'm a I'm a TOSA, like a teacher on special assignment for the district so that I support kind of all of our elementary libraries, help develop professional development, um, teach new teacher librarians the ropes, solve problems and answer questions on the district level, that, that, that sort of a thing. So um, it's, it's busy, but it's all, it's all really good stuff. It sounds like you have many hats. <laughs> yes, I call myself the Swiss Army knife of the school uh, in, in many, many ways. It's like, if something needs to be done, they're like, I bet Ben can do that, which is, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Yeah, it's a good and bad thing. I, it's not a bad thing when people realize you're the one who can do this, except when you're the only one who can do this. Uh, everybody gets lazy and uh, and, and it, things naturally fall into your lap. Yeah, and, and I don't mind doing any of it. The, the real problem comes, and not even problem, but the challenge becomes, well, how do you prioritize everything and, and get everything done? Because there are only a finite number of hours. Uh, and when the things you need to do exceed that, sometimes you got to get a little, little creative to, to pull it all off. Do you have help in your, in your library? Yeah, so we have a, a half-time assistant. So I have an assistant here on Thursdays, Fridays, and every other Wednesday. Uh, and so that um, is a change. When I first started here, we had full-time assistants and um, they you know, got slashed away in budget cuts much like, and I'm sure there are plenty of listeners out there shaking their fist at me that I even have a half-time assistant and we're very, very grateful to it, uh, to, to have them. Um, but it also means that we've had to kind of shift how things have done, um, kind of getting into, you know, later we're going to talk about what it means to empower elementary school students. Um, Keeping the library open, even when we lost our assistance, was a big, big deal for me in, in trying to, to provide um, that access to kiddos. So that was definitely a transition, but one that, you know, we, we, we've, we've managed so far. Yeah, I've uh, as somebody who has recently lost my assistant, um, the ones who notice it are the teachers, <laughs> yeah. because there were a lot of things that we were able to do to support our teachers, which fall by the wayside when you lose an assistant. And it really does make people realize all the things that we were able to do, which now have to be reconfigured or, like you said, changing the priorities of of what you can do in the time that you have allotted. So, you know, I'm so excited. I, I want to make sure that we showcase all the fantastic things you're doing, because a lot of these things are, are things that can be replicated in other people's programs. You know, but we do have to, to really just brag about this one thing. You were long listed for the School Library Journal's School Librarian of the Year for 2020. And, uh, you know, congratulations. I mean, of all the things that happened in 2020, this is one to be celebrated. You know, when somebody says long listed, I think it was a, it was a group of five people who were showcased. And then from, from that five, one person, uh, was, was designated the winner. But, but, to be in such a an elite group, uh, and then you know, School Library Journal did a, a feature on each one of you, talking about the amazing things, and that's where I, I knew we we had to make sure that you you were on the show. So, tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, so thanks. It was it was definitely um, a bit of a surreal experience, uh, just to be paid attention to and seen in that way. I mean, it was awesome. It was very, you know, it was an honor. And um, uh, being on the list was, was, I'm just so thankful to, to be recognized in that way. Um, there was a whole lot going on at the beginning of 2020. Um, our, uh, my wife and I had our fourth child, well, I guess she had the fourth child, I was along for the ride. Uh, that was also, um, you know, right when the world shut down for COVID and everything changed for a while. 
So that entire six month period is is kind of a blur. Uh, you know, there are definitely I remember it in images and, and bits and pieces here and there, but uh, absolutely an honor to be on the list and and to to not only be recognized alongside other teacher librarians that I already recognize or already interfacing with, and that that felt like a huge honor, but also to see so many other new people who I never never had a chance to to learn about before and and to see what they were doing as well and how they were impacting kids um was just a great experience well and you know friends it's worth noting that school library journal had not done an article like this in the past in the past they just announced who the winner was and and did you know these profiles on the winner but you know in this case they did a, an article just about the five candidates, and there's this fantastic quote, and I'll, I'll read it. Quote, we are delighted to honor the individuals selected for the first ever long list for our School Library of the Year award, end quote, says School Library Journal Editor-in-Chief Kathy Isazuka. Quote, by recognizing a range of achievements in programming and meeting student needs, School Library Journal can showcase the depth represented in this profession. We are pleased to hold up these standout educators to their local municipalities, as well as the greater K-12 school community, end quote. You know, this is like, wow, you got to be one of those people. And I think it's amazing. Thank you. And, and I appreciate what they did, too, because... Yes, we are all school librarians, but an elementary school library with a fixed schedule is such a different beast than, you know, a middle school uh, library with more of an open schedule or a high school library. I mean, every every stop along the way is so drastically different with such drastically different, you know, clientele with so many different needs. Um, so it, I agree. I think it was really cool that they kind of got the, the whole spectrum of what it means to be a school librarian, because it can mean so many different things. So I'm going to say something out loud, and you're going to think less of me. But friends, I taught elementary for 14 years on a fixed schedule. And there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't say to myself, you know, I could have done fill in the blank were it not for this ridiculous schedule that I teach. At one point, I was teaching six classes a day. At one point, I was teaching seven classes a day. And and it was just a constant, you know, new group of students coming in. And, and sometimes those classes were on top of one another. One was getting dropped off late. One was getting picked up early, you know. And, and it always seemed to be like I was having to compromise. And I was very aware there were so many things I could do if it wasn't this complete this constant influx of of new students coming in with all that that energy and you had to be on all the time yeah it's definitely a challenge um it's one of those things that i i don't think i trade for the world though just because it it provides you the opportunity to get to know every single kid in the school and to to help fill the needs of every single kid in the school um, you know, I, I think about my middle and high school colleagues and, and there are some kids who just never make it to the library after they leave elementary school. Uh, or if they do, it's, it's a forced thing for a class research project or something like that. And, um, you know, I originally got into this as a, a fourth and fifth grade teacher who kind of accidentally stumbled backwards into the library before realizing that it was the greatest job in the world. Uh, and, and I, yeah, I don't think I'd trade it. Getting to know every single kid, really knowing them, really supporting them, that, that is the best part of my job. Well, and I, I, especially when you can watch those kids grow up. And you remember what they were like as kinders. And for you, you get them even younger as, as um, your pre-K. And you get to watch these kids grow up. And strange, I now see my former elementary kids at the middle school because my, my sister does the middle school musicals. And I'll see them on stage singing and dancing. And what I see is the five-year-old them or the six-year-old yeah. them. And I, and I remember watching them grow up like that. So I, I oh, that's amazing. I've been doing this long enough now that I, I'm the only librarian that these kids have ever known, uh, which is which is awesome. I hit that a couple of years ago where no, I'm just nobody remembers a librarian other than me. Uh, and some of these kids I've literally known since they were in diapers before they could really speak. And so now seeing them as fifth graders and they're so grown up 
it's you're right. It's amazing, amazing to see them kind of grow up in front of your eyes. Well, and you know, you know them, and let's be selfish. Librarians are going to know these kids better than their classroom teachers because we may not see them every day, but we see them every year. Mm -hmm. And boy, that, that to be able to, to, you know, in September, when those teachers are lo looking at a, a classroom brand new, full of kids, they don't know. And for us, they come into the learning conference, you're like, hey, and they're like, oh, it's you. <laughs> and you've grown. And, and, you know, we stay the same age. It's, it's wonderful. Well, and you also, <laughs> you also get to see the hard work that all the adults are doing in the building pay off over time. So, for example, we had a, a kindergarten teacher who had an incredibly, incredibly challenging class. It's one of those things where, you know, if you've been in an elementary school long enough, you know that they come through in waves. And, you know, it's like, oh, everybody knows that that, that group of kids coming up, they're, they're, they're challenging. Uh, and to be able to go back to that teacher and say, you know what, you didn't see the, the, the results of your hard work when you were in kindergarten. But my goodness, this kid is absolutely knocking it out of the park in third grade, and you wouldn't believe how they've grown. And to be able to have that kind of long form perspective uh, is really valuable, too, and something I cherish. Well, and something I'm very aware of, because if I'm lucky at, at the high school level, I'll see my kids for four years, but you'll see them for six, yeah, possibly more, depending on your, your preschool arrangement. So friends, when I learn about our guests. I, I'm scouring the internet. I found a YouTube video which features Ben and your principal is just gushing about the value you bring to your school. And I'm just going to say it right now. No principal has ever gushed about me and done so in a way that you can go back and play it anytime you want. But how wonderful that your principal values you. Yeah, that was, that was, definitely a, a fun thing to to see and be a part of. So my my district after I was on the long list for the school library journal um, librarian of the year uh, decided to do a little I think two three minute feature on me just to put up on social media and things like that um, which was awesome uh, because a it let me kind of show off some of the things that I was doing hopefully to a wider wider um, group of, of our school community because the truth is that not a lot of adults really understand what happens in a school library. Um, and so to be able to kind of put some of that stuff out there was great. Um, but yeah, it was always surreal to see yourself talked about. Um, you know, I don't take compliments particularly well because I'm pretty harsh on myself, but, um, you know, probably a healthy thing to, to, to see. Um, my administration, I've been really fortunate because as they have seen the good that I do as they have seen the work that I put in and as they have understood the reasons that I'm doing it with that has come kind of more and more freedom, more and more trust, more and more, um, you know, uh, more and more. Yes. Uh, more and more of the administrator telling me yes, when I have a crazy idea. Uh, and it wasn't always that way. It's something that kind of built slowly over time. Uh, but what, what I tell a lot of other teacher librarians when they ask me about it is, the more good that you do and the more that you can show your administration the good that you're doing, the more leeway that they're going to give you, the more freedom that you're going to have to do even better and better and better things, which is one of the reasons why it's so important to put the good work that you are doing in front of the eyes of your principal, in front of the eyes of your district, in front of the eyes of the people who are going to make decisions. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I watched that video and I'm like, what an advocacy piece for all the amazing things. I mean, we talk about raising the profile. What are the things we can do as, as librarians to make sure that the decision makers, the people who hold the purse strings, the people who are, again, the ones who are going to say yes to, to the things that you bring to the table and to be able to see that video and recognize that that's being you know, viewed by a lot of people, including the people who get to decide whether or not you're full time, get to decide whether or not you have an assistant at all. So I, I think that's 
always a good thing. And and I, I love when you criticize yourself because we are our biggest critics. We are always going to be our biggest critics. And I think it's a fairly consistent trait of school librarians. We don't become complacent. We don't settle back and, and rest on our laurels and ride it out till retirement because we've never had that luxury. As I've tried to explain to people, nobody's going to cut fourth grade. Nobody's going to decide that we don't need to teach sixth grade math. But the librarian is something that has not always been a given. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things, too, where you could be doing the most amazing things in the world. And if the decision makers don't know that you're doing those things, that's not going to be factored into any sort of a decision making process. So that's been one of my goals is to just make sure people can see in my building, in my district, kind of the cool things that we do so that when that discussion comes up and, oops, we know we've got to do a 5% budget cut this year, that that it'll give them some pause. Um, Not to say that it's going to make, oh, you know, I'm not going to be able to save libraries, but if I can give them pause, if I can make them consider it more, then I feel like I've done, done something, you know, something good. Well, and all too often, our district administrators who aren't in the buildings every day sort of cling to those sort of antiquated ideas of what we do. And until we change their minds, they are going to simply fill in the blank with what they think we do, as opposed to, you know, what what they see in the video that was created about you. You know, I'd love to learn because you were talking about about. Uh, bringing the makerspace to your kinders mm-hmm. and your, your is it kindergarten and first yep. grade? Does that mean that you're leaving your, your library and you're going to them with your, mm-hmm. your makerspace um, items? Okay. Again, that is also a good strategy because then you become far more of, of a presence in the school because you in fact leave the library. Yeah, so we do maker, uh, we, I deliver a maker cart to my kindergarten and first grade uh, teachers with some very specific activities on there that are developmentally appropriate for those K-1 kids so that they can have those hands-on experiences making and, and learning and problem solving and, and all those sorts of things. Um, you know, I did a lot of work with preschool back in high school and in college. And, you know, just that, that, that constructivist philosophy and being able to see kids actively hands-on with things as they learn. Um, We know it's valuable. The research shows it's valuable. And unfortunately it's something that is oftentimes lacking from the curricula that are purchased and, and implemented in our classrooms. So I know it's great for the kids. It, it's it's a good thing for for the library as well to show how important and integral that we are, um, and it's just it's awesome to see those kids get those experiences and play with some of those things that otherwise they may not be exposed to. And that's part of empowering, as we get to talk about it too, is giving them access and giving them opportunity to things that they otherwise would not have. I think that it's it's such a smart idea to use the sort of structure that is built into the classroom routine that you bring something special to them rather than try to use a lot of that energy in the library to do a makerspace with with your littles. And I, I want to ask also, because you included your budget in the show notes, does that include things like your consumables and your makerspace materials? Yep. Because so, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we have a budget of five dollars per student. So this year, that's a total of about fifteen hundred dollars. Um, generally speaking, I try to only buy library books with that money, and then materials that I need to get those books into kids' hands. Things like book tape. Things like you know. Um, dust jacket covers, things like that. The way that I have it in my mind, that's what that's for. I will then do additional fundraising, um, you know, in collaboration with PTA or through grants or other sorts of things. That's how I have slowly built up the makerspace. Um, You know, I know that $1,500 for books is not enough, even though, you know, that's what I have been given. Um, So I 
personally don't want to go and buy that really cool new makerspace toy with that money because in my mind that money should go to books that that money should go to my collection and making sure that my collection is as good as it can be and fill all the needs of all my kids and then we we get creative to 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 build the makerspace in other ways Absolutely. You know, um, I have always asked school librarians who've been recognized for their excellence in their libraries to share with listeners. And friends, you're going to love to learn about all these amazing programs that Ben has been able to bring to his students and the focus of today's episode, Empowering Elementary Students. Ben, let's get started and talk about the things that that make your space so incredibly uh accessible to your students, because I think one of the reasons why you've been recognized nationally for all that you do, I think you've put a, an interesting spin on what our libraries should look like to better serve the students who are in our spaces. We have slowly here, just over the course of the last eh, nine years or so, very slowly, piece by piece, kind of fundamentally altered what the book browsing and checkout experience is. Um, it started out with me deciding one day after looking around my library, you know what? My nonfiction isn't very good. It's really, really hard for kids to discover things. They don't know where things are. Even if I told them where things were, they weren't going to be able to find it on their own. And so even though I had no idea what I was doing, I looked at my nonfiction and I said, I want to change this. I want to fundamentally change the way that we do nonfiction here. Um, I had long struggled with the Dewey Decimal System because as a former fifth grade teacher, I knew that even our oldest kids in the school, a large majority of them, did not have the skills necessary to navigate decimals to the hundredths place in a real life library setting. And in my opinion, and based on my experiences with those kids, no matter how much I tried to teach them decimals, no matter no matter which direction I banged my head against which wall in my building, nothing I was going to do was going to give them those skills, give all the, the kids the skills necessary to navigate the library. And so I sat there and I thought one day, you know what, it's not good enough for me to even get 95% of my kids up to speed here because the 5% of kids who then wouldn't be able to use the library, those are the 5% of kids who need it the most. And, and so I decided that we were going to change it. And so I did a genrefication of my nonfiction. That was my very, very first major library project that I allowed myself to try coming into the, to the profession. Um, the books are still in roughly Dewey order, um, but I've done some things like I took pets out of the 600s and I stuck them with all the rest of the animal books. I took energy out of the eight different places that it existed and I stuck it all together in one section. And I kind of worked with kids to figure out what are the topics here? You know, if we were to split our nonfiction into topics, what topics would those be? What would they be based on what you want to read about? What would they be based on the, the collection that we have? And so I just kind of shelf by shelf shifted and I would have different topics on each shelf. Um, those would be very clearly browsable with full signage, with very simple words, lots of pictures so that kids could look at a shelf and instantly know exactly what it was. Um, and as I went through this process, uh, kind of shelf by shelf, it was pretty amazing because even before I had the actual um, data to back it up, even before I had circulation data, uh, anecdotally, I worked left to right. Everything to the left that was done was being browsed and checked out like crazy, and everything to the right wasn't being touched. And sure enough, as we went, the farther I got, the more stuff was getting checked out. And by the time that I finished, then we were able to to run some hard data year over year that showed a significant increase in circulation, uh, especially in history and geography, uh, and and especially in kind of that uh, earth science area. Both of those absolutely skyrocketed after we did that. And that kind of gave me the confidence then to tackle the entire collection. You know, something I find incredibly freeing about what you just said is, number one, you didn't wait until the summer, and I'll just do it over the summer so it'll be ready when the kids come here. Because by the way, you should never work over the summer unless you're getting a stipend. Um, and also, it, honestly, you could see, you know, because you were doing this 
as as the year progressed, you were able to see that indeed what you were doing was working. And so you simply, I, I, it's almost like you didn't overthink it. And you're just like, I'm going to go with a system that I know is intuitive. And as this, and the, the student sort of validated that as the year went on. Friends, you're going to love looking at, I, I want Ben to explain this because I'm looking at a Google sheet of your nonfiction genres. And it's so like, this makes all the sense in the world. And, but I want to see, you know, could you explain, like, I see the nonfiction and then character and culture and facts and family and government. What are the numbers in between the one, the two? You go all the way up to the, what, 16, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so are those the shelf? Is that the area in the library that you're looking at? Yep. So each column of shelves is its yes. own number. So one is the very okay. first column of nonfiction shelves. Two is the second column of nonfiction shelves. And then so on. It goes all the way up to us. So I have 16 columns 16. of nonfiction shelves. Yeah. What's great about that, too, is um, I didn't want to sacrifice discoverability or in any way, shape, or form. I didn't want a kid to have a harder time when they looked things up in Destiny, which is our management system. Uh, I didn't want them to have a harder time than finding it on the shelf. And so what I did was, that is what shows up in Destiny. So three, NF, C-U-L for culture, culture. And so then the kid knows, oh, okay, I go to shelf three, right? I go to column three, I find where it says NFCUL, and I know the book's going to be right there. And so it's a very small range of books that the kids then have to actually shift through. So not only is it now browsable for them to just walk through the library and see it and pick it up like that, but if a kid is looking for a specific book, it's also significantly faster and significantly easier for the kid to find that book. That was almost accidental um, because <laughs> when, I, when I set off, I was really focused on browsability and discoverability because that's what our library was lacking most of. And, and then I kind of accidentally without realizing it created a system that was way easier for kids to use when they when they use Destiny than to actually locate that book on the shelf independently. You know, you're going to have these kids for six years. And I think the fantastic thing about it is what you didn't do is what so many people do is I am obligated as the elementary librarian to teach the kids how to find things in the in any library, because when they go to middle school, they're going to have to know how to find things in the library. And the middle school librarian is then passing them up to the, the high school. And the fact of the matter is that the kids need to know how to find the books in your library. And, and that is, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yeah. And, you know, we have such a, a, a small window of time where we can really help connect them to the books that are going to turn them into readers, that are going to turn them into, you know, just lovers of books. And it's one of those things where if I waited until everyone was ready to then teach them, I mean, first of all, not everyone is going to be ready when they're in my school. And second of all, I am going to have turned off so many kids who are too timid to ask because you, you know, we've all got those kids who they'll ask you to, to show them 87 books in a 10 minute window. And those kids are awesome. I love them very much, but there's also those kids who, even if you're right, there suggesting things for them. They're not, they, they want to do it on their own and they're not necessarily comfortable asking for help. And so we really need to make it so that all of our kids, all of our kids, every single kid can be successful accessing that library collection, which was kind of the impetus for the whole thing. Listeners, you're going to love looking at the the images that are included. There's a fantastic video, which I watched at least three times before uh, Ben and I started recording just now. And you are lowering the barrier for access because all of your signs include vibrant pictures and, and actual images, not clip art of something, but actual images that would uh, enable your pre-readers and, and your early readers to already know what's, what they can find on that shelf and feel confident about it. Yeah. And that was, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and it's kind of tedious and it's a whole lot of searching and copying and pasting, but it's one of those things that, that absolutely works. The, the more pictures you have, the simpler it is, the clearer it is. 
the more successful kids are going to be. And the more successful they are early, the more they're going to keep coming back, the more they're going to access those materials that they really want to access and and the 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 better off things are going to be for them. Well, and friends, if you could imagine, and when you look at each of your library shelves, and this, there, there does, the presumption is, is that your collection will have enough shelf space to be able to do this. But if you can imagine every single shelf, an eight and a half by 11 sign on every single shelf, and I, I, this is, I've never seen anything like this before. I might see a sign where the whale books start and the dolphin books start and the tigers are or the mammals, but to, to devote an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper sign that leads, is it, it's sort of on the end, it's on the end of each bookshelf so that there isn't a doubt in anybody's mind what books go on that shelf. Yeah. And it's, all of my bins also have pictures on the front and labels on the front. Um, you know, I I think it, at last count, I had officially in Destiny 288 sublocations, uh, which is kind of hilarious and kind of a pain for me to manage. But it's not about me. It's about them. And and there are systems in place to make it easy for them to navigate. Um, and, you know, it's... It's one of those things just kind of going way, way back when I was first doing this nonfiction genreification project. Um, and this picture, I think, is my pinned tweet still on Twitter. Uh, and we, you know, I have a student in a, a deaf and hard of hearing preschool uh, who come in to see me once a week and we read books and have fun. And the preschools are just the best. Preschool is awesome. Um, but we had a kiddo come in who was nonverbal. Um and as soon as this nonfiction project was done, he came in and he saw it and he went over there immediately and he honed in on maps. And within 35 seconds, he had pulled off a book about maps. And it was one of those things where we could never figure out what that kid wanted before. But this system let that kid find books. And that was one of the greatest moments of my teaching career. Um, and it's, and it, to me, it's just, it's just that anecdotal proof to go along with the statistical proof that, that it absolutely works and that the, the, the more browsable and the easier it is for kids to navigate that library independently, the more successful we are going to be at hooking those kids up with the books that they, they really want to need. Well, and am I correct? The word browsification uh, is uh, one, one that I, I saw somewhere in our notes, the browsification of, of our library spaces. Can you talk about what you have done, um, especially when it comes to your, um, your chat, like your early chapter books? And you've, you've really made this incredibly, um, you just want to go out and touch all the books because they're all facing you. And, and well, I think that yeah. you sort of taken a, 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 a We've sort of taken a, a page out of uh, the sort of what the, the bookstores used to do Yeah, when we had bookstores. <laughs> the, you know, you wanting to, to flip through the books is exactly the purpose, right? Like we are attempting to help these kids browse through books, attempting to help these kids see titles, attempting to help them see front covers to really find what they are looking for. So just about all my picture books, just about all my early reader books, and just about all my early chapter books now um, I have put them all in bins and they are all front facing. And so it's a bin per shelf with very clear labeling as to what's in that bin. That leaves just enough uh, space next to the bin to stand up a book so that you're also displaying book covers uh, significantly more than we used to be. Um, and by having those books that are generally geared towards our earlier readers in a place where they can browse, in a place where they can flip through, in a place where they can pick up a book, and if they don't like it, they just stick it back right in the exact same bin. Um, you know, we don't need to worry about the exact space on a shelf. We just make sure it goes back in the right bin. And, and that has been really successful at helping kids discover the books that they want, find those books. Um, yeah. And... The topics are kind of all over the place. Um, some of the topics are based on our collections. Uh, some of them are based on our curricula. So we have a very specific Tommy DePaula bin because they read a lot of Tommy DePaula books in first grade. And so I know they're going to ask for them. So there's a bin for that. Um, you know, kids love dogs. There's a bin for that. And so it's based on what kids ask for, what kids need, what the curriculum shows, all of those things. And just turned into hopefully a much easier way for kids to discover books on their own. 
Well, and you don't have to explain it to a kid because it makes sense. Trying to explain that books are organized by the author's last name, Mm -hmm. something I have done for 14 years and apparently never questioned it. Um, (laughs) I I feel like there's something fatally flawed. I was, my, my attention was misdirected. Friends, you have to watch this video, which we've included in the show notes because you'll see book bins on the floor and that's not just for the purposes of the video. Like if you go, if I go to your library today, there are book bins on the floor because our students are closer to the floor than they are to say the top of bookcases. And, you know, explain that decision when you first said, you know what? I, I obviously don't have enough table space for these bins. I'm going to start putting them on the floor and even underneath tables. And when you look at this, you're like, of course, this makes all the sense in the world. So that originally came because um, when I first started doing all this collection work, uh, I realized that I was going to have to weed like crazy. Um, we, I had a very old collection. It's a 1975 building. We had a lot of books from 1975 that had never been checked out. Uh, and I realized to reclaim the space that I needed in order to make things more browsable, more discoverable, easier for kids, better for kids that we were going to have to significantly pare down what we had in the collection. Um, And as we have done that, and as we have continued to run out of space, because I'm pretty committed to making displaying books one of the primary things that we do in the library, I started to think, okay, so I don't really have a good solution to biographies. So where in the world can I put biographies? And where can I put them in a way where they're still going to be browsable, they're going to be centrally located, and I'm still going to have plenty of space to display individual titles. And so the, the, the way that I came up with to do that that has worked really well is I've got two tables pushed together, two rectangular tables. On top, I have displays of all sorts of cool picture book biographies. But if a kid doesn't find what they're looking for there, they can just go down a little bit. And then, oh, look, there's my civil rights leaders. There are my artists. And so every bin then is browsable. So if they don't find the person they're looking for, well, they can go down and they can do some some flipping from there. Uh, and that has been really effective, too, in terms of just having more places for kids to go look for books. Your office is also a student space. Is that right? Yes. So my kids love to do all sorts of large projects in the makerspace, like large projects that would render significant portions of the makerspace unusable to other students. And so kind of my solution to that is that I have a relatively reason, you know, I have a reasonably large office. And so a lot of that has been turned over into student space. Um, It's student storage for the large cardboard projects that they have created. It's student storage for um, maybe they are working on creating a very specific Lego creation and they know that if they leave it out, that it's going to get broken, but they only have 20 minutes to work on it. We can find you a drawer for that. And so my office is something that students come in and out of on a very frequent, very consistent basis. Um, you know, which is normally not an issue. And normally I welcome it. You do have some kids who, when I'm in the middle of a Zoom call, will just pop their head in and start talking to me. But, you know, in my mind, that's kind of a small price to pay to to making it more functionally useful for them so that we can do the things that we want to do without messing with other people's ability to do that in the makerspace as well. Well, I think the problem that you've solved, which uh, some people have complained loudly on social media about, is that especially things that are made with cardboard, Mm -hmm. have been accidentally removed and disposed of because not everybody realizes that that was a project that somebody had put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into. And and all of a sudden to find out the next day that the custodial team who, you know, was subbed in because they're running short on, on, on custodians. So they have a backup team coming in, had no idea that that was some kid's project. So your office has become like the student project zone. And I, I think that's wonderfully generous of you. I don't know how ready I am to give up my my office to um, to some of my students, but I know it happens, especially when when needs needs dictate. Yep, and you know that it doesn't completely solve the problem. Uh, I definitely had to go dumpster diving a few months ago when we had a substitute custodian who who took things out of the office, but thankfully we were able to recover everything without too much water damage, so that was good. 
what have you done to make sure that this is a space where students feel empowered? If we're talking about empowering students, um, you know, I, I want to drill down a little bit there. And I was thinking about, well, what does it really mean to empower students? And in my mind, empowering students is is three things. It's giving them access. It's giving them independence. And it's giving them opportunity. My entire empowering philosophy came from kind of actually where I started my career. Uh, when I first got hired, I was teaching in an incredibly wealthy school district in Kansas. And those kids had everything that they needed. They had the books that they needed. They had the um, experiences that they needed. When I moved here to Washington for the first time, I was on kind of the other side, the east side of my school district. And same there, you know, th those kids had access pretty much to what they needed. When I wound up teaching fifth grade where I am now, it, it was upsetting to me how my students did not have that. They did not have access to those uh, experiences. They did not have access to those materials. They did not have access to those books. And so that kind of helped me evolve my philosophy about what my job is as their school librarian. Those kids aren't going to be necessarily given the opportunity to code robots. I'm going to give them the opportunity to code robots. Those kids maybe aren't going to have all the brand new graphic novels to read. I'm going to make sure that those kids have all those brand new graphic novels to read. And so I want to make sure that they have access, that they can have all the things to make sure that they have the same experiences as everybody else. Independence. I need them to be able to use those things independently. Um, and the independence piece especially came up when we did lose our full-time media assistants, because if I'm teaching a class, I don't want the library to close. I want the library to remain open. I want those kids to be able to come in and continue using it. Uh, and I also want them to have the opportunity. I want them to play with those really interesting computer science-y things. I want them to be able to 3D print. I want them to be able to, to do all those things to make sure that they see the potential in what they can be. Maybe they see what we do in the, in the makerspace and they decide, man, I really like coding. Well, they could turn that into a hobby or even a career. Same with graphic design, same with robotics, same with all sorts of things. And I don't want them to go through their entire elementary school career without being able to see and access and do those things. I wanted to ask you, because you just said something that I was like, wow, um, because I used to teach elementary. If I had a class in the library, I wasn't also able to support checkout from just random students coming up to the to the library. But how have you managed to do all of that and, and be working with a class at the same time? So one of the saving graces there has been self-checkout. Uh, so I have set it up so that kids can return their own books and kids can check out their own books. And we spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year with our third, fourth, and fifth grade students teaching them how to return books, how to check out their own books, how to see the books that they do have checked out. So that when I am on those story steps, reading a story to those kindergartners, that those third, fourth, and fifth graders can still come in and access the library and access the collection completely independent of me. Uh, and what I tell them is, I love helping you. I just want to make sure that you can do things without me just in case I can't help you. Uh, and that, that really hits home to them. And, um, you know, you, you have kids who are coming down and, and swapping out books every single day. Uh, you know, it's one of those things also where, you know, I let my kids have two books at a time. But in my library, that's just, yeah, two books at a time, but with the option of two more and the option of two more and the option of two more, you can always get more books as long as you're in school. Uh, and so we do have kids who go through a significant number uh, of books in a week, which is always awesome to see. Uh, now, generally, I only do that for my third, fourth and fifth graders because I have found through experimentation that second grade um, just struggles to do it effectively and do it correctly. Uh, so for those K-1 and 2 students, there are open hours at the beginning of every single day so that every day those kids do have access to the library. And teachers also know that they can just double check my schedule. And if I'm not with the class, they can send kids down as well, those K-1 and 2 kiddos.
Are the kids checking their books in and checking yes. out or simply putting their books in it? Yes. yes. So they do. And how, how do you do that? You change the, cause you have to change the, what the screen is. So I have three separate computers. One of them is a check in computer and the other two are check out computers. And so we have it set up in destiny that there is literally a patron that is only there to check in books. And we have patrons that are only there to check out books. Um, and so uh, we have those specific logins set up. And so there is one computer, and that's the one with the red, the red scanner, and that's where you give your books back. And then the two with the black scanners, those are the ones that you check out your books from. Uh, and then there's very clear signage with, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this. And so by doing that and with enough repetition, um, just about all of our older kids can handle it without issue. Um, I also have it set up so that um, there are a lot of animal noises that go along with our circulation. Uh, you know, it has the, the, the fringe benefit of really confusing the people if they're not used to in our school. They're like, why is the library mooing? Uh, but what's awesome about it is then if I'm in the middle of reading a book, I can hear that animal noise and I can know exactly what that kid needs. So if there's a moo that happens, I'm like, oh, you know what? You've got a book on hold. And then I go right back to my story. If there's a bark, it's, you know what, there's a problem there. You might need to come back later so I can help you with it. Um, and so it's one of those things where just I'm doing as much as I can to make the system completely functional without me, but still I will be aware of what's going on in case I needed to pause and intervene if something strange was going down. Another thing I, I think about empowering our students is giving them a, a better understanding of the books that are in the library. And you had some great strategies for recommending books. And I'm hoping that you can, can go through some of these because I think that recommending books to me was just, I don't think I ever gave much thought to it. I'm feeling very inadequate friends right now, uh, talking to somebody who excels at what he does. You know, would you talk about some of the things you did to familiarize your, your students when you're book talking your books? Because that's how our students are going to check out books with confidence. What were some of the things you did that are particularly successful? So I book talk a lot, uh, just about every single class I'm book talking books. Um, you know, for my older kids, I'm giving a lot of very specific book talks. I have a little bit more time with them, which means I can pull three, four books and say, hey, maybe you're interested in these. And what I always try to do is I try to do three book talks. I try to do it from a variety of genres and a variety of reading levels so that I'm never book talking something that and the kids like, oh, I can't read any of those. Um, I keep track of what I book talk to each class uh, on kind of a spreadsheet just to try to make sure that um, I'm not hitting too much fantasy or I'm not, you know, I only talked about graphic novels again or, or any of those things. Uh, and so I try to do that. Um, I also do a unit later in the year where uh, kids create their own book talks and they record them onto a Flipgrid. Um, I guess it's Flip now. Uh, so anyway, we use Flip and we record those book talks. And uh, instead of the, the, the selfie, they take a, a picture of the book's cover. And then they just write the sublocation. And so therefore, a kid can click on that book. They can see the book. If that book interests them, the sublocation's right there. They can go see if the book's here today. And so um, we have, it, it actually all started because uh, during COVID, when we were all stuck at home, one of the things that I was doing is recording a billion book talks to try to help kids discover books. And so I took those and I kind of put them into this overall flip for us all to use. And now kids get to add to it as well. And we have a very specific time later in the year where everybody gets to add to it. And then there are other times when um, if a kid is really excited about the book, they can add it any time that they want to. They can add a book talk there to help to help each other discover books. I, I love that you mentioned the I can't believe it's not checked out category. Is that a, is, are those just books you're sitting there scratching your head going, how is it this book has not been checked out? I bought it because I thought it'd be a great book to check out. It's actually quite the opposite. It, that is the section where um, I'm surprised it's on the shelf because kids ask for it so much 
that uh, generally speaking, it's not there. So all my Babysitter's Club graphic novels go there. All my Minecraft books go there. All my Pokemon books go there. So the I can't believe it's not checked out is the I know I'm going to get asked 15 different times about this in a checkout period. And so all those books go in one place and kids just know, oh, I want a Minecraft book. That's where I go. Oh, I want a Pokemon book. That's where I go. Uh, it's kind of the most popular books in the library go in that section. Got it. What's bin of the week? So the bin of the week is the way that I book talk to my um, younger kiddos. Uh, so I don't have as much time with them. I have 30 minutes to both get a read aloud and a lesson and a checkout in. And so what I do with bin of the week is I try to align it so that most of my classes are reading a similar book. Uh, all at the same time. Not necessarily the same book, but but kind of a similar book. And then I can go, oh, do you like these really goofy fantasy stories like I do? Hey, check out the bin of the week. And it's a special display space where I can pull out one of our uh, browsified bins and I can lay all those books out and display all those books so that I can make a connection. If you liked this book we read today, gosh, you're going to love one of these books over here. And so that's a way that I, um, I make the bins a little bit more accessible, a little bit more highlighted or spotlighted and can then help recommend uh, kids books that way as well. You know, I, I want to hear about some of the special things that you do in your library when it comes to, to programming. And, and what are the Falcon Authors? So the Falcon Authors is a way that classes or individual kids can publish books into our library. And so uh, I will either work with a teacher or I will work with individual kids who want to publish their books. And we will make sure that they've gone through proper revision processes, that their final draft is as good as it can be. And then we barcode it, we put it in Destiny, and we put it in the Falcon Author section so that the kids can search and find themselves in our library catalog. They can check out their own books. Their friends can check out their books. And, you know, it, it's a way to celebrate the hard work that our writers are doing um, and, and really helps make them feel special and, and helps, helps give them an audience to write for as well. I'm curious, do you bind these books? Is there a binding you would recommend if there are listeners right now who want to replicate that in their own space, what binding have you, have you decided? And do you use like a laminated cover? How does this all come together? So a lot of that, it kind of depends. It depends on what the kid wants, or if it's a whole class, it depends on what the teacher wants. Uh, oftentimes you will have teachers who will add like a hard, clear plastic on the front and the back. They will do kind of that coil binding. We've got a binding machine up in the staff room, that sort of thing. But then you'll have kids who they just make it on paper and they say, no, nah, I just want to staple it. And so we staple it together and we put the barcode on there and we, uh, we make sure it's got a call number on it and, and it goes into the system like that. So I've done it multiple ways. And, um, I mean, you know, if you want it to last longer, you know, the more work you put into the binding, the the longer it'll last. But for some kids, it's like, no, I'm good. I just I just want that in the library now. But that's I love that. So what about Maker Recess and your wall of fame? Ah, so Maker Recess, um, our third, fourth and fifth graders have access to the makerspace four days a week during their lunch recess. So it's a, a 20 minute chunk of time where the makerspace is open and kids can come to the makerspace. And the only rules are you need to be making something or you need to be learning something. As long as you're making something or learning something, it's all fair game. And so you will see all sorts of things going on. You'll see kids you know, on YouTube w with drawing tutorials, learning how to draw their favorite things. You'll see kids making their own video games. You'll see kids making forts out of cardboard. You'll see kids inventing and playing their own video games. It just all, all sorts of, of different activities. Um, that is, that is Maker Recess. Uh, along with Maker Recess, we tend to do um, a monthly maker challenge and a monthly art challenge. Um, so for example, this week's maker challenge is pretty, pretty, pretty basic. It's just complete an hour of code. If you complete an hour of code at any point in time during this month, you've completed the maker challenge. Our art challenge this week, uh, this month is pixel art. Uh, and it's a really, really popular one. We have kids who are making pixel art on grid paper, kids who are making pixel art in the Bloxels video game building app, uh, kids who are making pixel art out of little uh, colorful blocks. Um, but th th this one has captured the imagination. Uh, anybody who participates gets to write their name on our window. Uh, the win It's my office window. And that office window is the Maker Recess Wall of Fame. So you'll have kids getting their name up 
10 times on the window in a school year, the, the, the ones who are, you know, participatory more in the makerspace. Uh, and then there are little maker and art trophies for the, the winner every month. And sometimes it's a panel of judges and sometimes it's a random drawing, but um, kids get their picture taken with the trophy and then they get to take the trophy home. But, you know, it gives them all, all of the reasons to love your space because, you know, and oftentimes when you've got those makers, you might be tapping students who don't consider themselves to be readers. Maybe these st- students don't crave this space because they want to read books, but because of the activities that happen in the same space. And so you... You're making sure that everybody is going to feel welcome and that they belong in, in the space that you've created. And that, that's part of that culture, uh, when you, when you're in your, your library. You know, tell me, you know, I, I've done bookmark contests. It's work. Um, have you found a way to, to make it fun for kids? And because I know for, for some of my students, this is just not something that they're going to find that really speaks to them and, and their interests. So our bookmark contest, uh, was, pretty standard and was pretty, it was very, very popular. So we have a, you know, a piece of paper, the kid designs the bookmark, we choose one winner from each grade level or two winners from each grade level. And then we print a bunch of them on cardstock. And so then every kid in our school gets to pick a bookmark that was designed in the bookmark contest on top of which they get to keep their own if they designed one. Uh, And so, so that way, again, it's an authentic way for kids to be working towards a goal. It's another way of them kind of publishing their own work. Uh, And then we end up with a whole lot of bookmarks. And if there's one thing elementary students cannot have enough of, it is bookmarks. You know, Read Across America is something that some some librarians do. Um, How have you made this uh, something that kids like to celebrate? So Read Across America at Fircrest is something that has evolved over the last few years. Uh, Right now, what it looks like is we make it a whole month. And so it is Read Across America month. And so I curate a list of books that are um, from around the United States, many, many different locations. And every week, every kid in the school gets that book read aloud to them. Uh, Sometimes it's on video, sometimes it's in person. Um, but every kid gets to experience that book, gets to learn about one of those locations in America. Uh, so we are quite literally like reading across America. We are going all over uh, as we read. Uh, usually each book has an activity that goes with it. Um, we also do ourselves uh, a little March Madness style. Last year it was book character bracket. Elephant and Piggy, in fact, dominated as one would expect they might Uh they they did win. Bad Kitty had a very good good showing last year, though more more than I would have expected. Um, this year, I'm not exactly sure what that is yet. It's def- we're definitely doing another bracket. I'm just not sure if it's favorite book. I don't know if it's a different set of book characters. So uh, stay tuned uh, on that one, and I'm I'm sure we'll be posting about it. So, and you also do a a dress up with your students. Is this uh, on a certain day? Yeah, I think it was the last day of the month uh, to celebrate. Uh, the to to celebrate the coronation of Elephant and Piggy as our bracket champions, everyone was able to come dressed up as any book character that they wanted to, and so we um we had a lot of really cool ones. Uh, gosh, I don't know if you can go back and find the picture, but it was um I was uh, Camilla Cream last year. I had the stripes, and it took me many many weeks for my skin to go back to normal after that particular dress up day. But it was worth it. The pictures were pretty good. Yeah, friends, scroll through the Twitter. It it is it, it the picture is still there. When we talk about uh, Battle of the Books, I've not seen this before. Students versus teachers. So that is kind of one of our our big finales. So we do kind of an an in house Battle of the Books here. Um, I have been slowly gathering, um, you know inexpensive copies of good books so that we have class set or not class sets, but like groups of five or six of them. Um, We rotate them every year. We write the questions ourselves. We do the competitions ourselves. Um, The after every kid does, or after every team faces every other team, we have a fourth grade champion and we have a fifth grade champion. And those fourth and fifth grade champions get to advance to the assembly. At the assembly, the fourth grade kids face off in front of their peers against the fourth grade teachers. The fifth grade 
team faces off against the fifth grade teachers. And then we have kind of one final competition between those two championship teams to see who will in fact be the battle of the books champions. Um, it's, it's an incredible amount of fun to see those teachers up there uh, getting questions right, getting questions wrong, seeing the kids react when the teachers get the questions wrong. It's just such an engaging and, and joyful experience. It's always a blast to do. Well, and, and it requires work on your part. It requires you putting in that time. And But it sounds like, again, raising the profile of what you do to all school assemblies, these activities require people to recognize that the librarian is making these things possible. And this, these are the kinds of things that people point and say, you know what, this is really special. And what what Mr. Court is doing is really special. And it's energizing kids in a way that is fun and memorable. And it sounds like the the teachers are getting involved. You know, I'd love to, you know, ask you about your book fair, just because I know that this is one of those things, many people see book fairs as a necessary evil. It's something that, especially if you're working in a district where the funding is going to be modest, that this is one way that you can build up your collections. But you found an interesting solution to address some of the inequity when it comes to students who who come to the school, perhaps not with any money for, for books. Yeah. So book fair is one of my main sources of income. Um, I wouldn't have a makerspace if it wasn't for the book fair. And so necessary evil, I think, is a, a, a good way to put it. Um, but I really wasn't comfortable, just like I know some of your previous guests and and many of many of uh, the listeners out there were not comfortable with running a book fair because you are you are setting up a situation where those who have means are having this joyful experience and you're actually creating a negative experience and and a harmful experience for those who don't. And so what I did um, uh it was uh, on a whim is not correct. So one year when I was running my book fair, I just said, you know what? I wonder, I wonder how many books that I can buy for kids who couldn't otherwise go to the book fair. And that was kind of the the seed of the idea. And so then I kind of went on to some of my own personal channels and reached out to my friends, reached out to my family, said, look, here's what I'm doing. I want to send as many kids to the book fair as we possibly can. It's such a joyful experience, and I want everyone to have it, whether or not they can afford to go. And the response was astounding. And we ended up raising a significant amount of money, enough so that we could send with a $10 book fair voucher, every single kid who uh, was on free and reduced lunch at our school, every single kid who was homeless or in transition, Every single kid who was new to the country, uh, we I worked with our Family Resource Center and our principal to identify who are all the kids who we know would benefit to this or from this, and we were able to raise enough money um, to send them all to the book fair. And it was it was a special experience to see those kids hopping up and down, cheering. You know, one of them you know, a little bit of hyperbole, but saying it's the best day of their life and they never thought they'd be able to go to the book fair. And it's one of those, one of those absolutely heart filling experiences. Um, and we were able to do it again this year and we were able to get to even more kids. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a great experience and it's something that I plan on doing every single year because, you know, all kids deserve to go to the book fair. And, and if there's ways for me to make sure that that can happen, then I'm going to do whatever it takes. And, you know, it, it was great. Wow. You know, Ben Court, I am so grateful that you have given us this window into this amazing program that you have so lovingly created over the years. You know, I'm, I, I imagine 2023 has a lot of hope and, and, and need opportunities for you. What are some of the things you're excited about doing moving into this second half of the school year? That is a really good question. What am I looking to do? So uh, one thing about, um, you know, genrefying or browsifying your collection is that it's never done. It's something that is just constantly ongoing, constantly tweaking, constantly changing. Um, I really need to look at my poetry and how I'm displaying my poetry. I really need to think about fairy and folk tales. Uh, think about which ones we really need, which ones maybe we shouldn't have for a variety of reasons and how better to display them. 
uh, you know, always looking to implement new things in the makerspace. I now I just bought myself a little 3D drawing pen and trying to think, hmm, how can I get those to some of our younger kiddos? Um, you know, all just all all sorts of things. And then um, trying to get it all done and still have time to go home and be with my kids, too. Exactly. Ben Court, please let us know, how can we follow you on social media? So I am on Twitter, uh, at Ben Court. That is B-E-N-K-O-R-T. Uh, I have not been posting there as much recently, but I hope to get back in the groove now that things are calmer. Uh, we had a very, very hectic end of our year. And so things are calming down now, so I'm hoping to post some more things on there. Uh, feel free to reach out, message me on there. I'm always happy to answer questions or give feedback or any of those things, you know. I think that we as a profession are better together. And I think the more that we share and the more that we help make each other better, the better it is for all of us. Ben, I wish you a very happy 2023 and thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. And thank you so much for having me on. Um, I am a bit of a podcast junkie myself. It's pretty rare to see me working without an earbud in my ear. And so to be on a podcast is a pretty surreal and exciting and fun experience. So I appreciate you having me on. Have a great evening. Thanks, you too. Friends, I don't know what you were doing on this recent three-day holiday weekend, but Ben Court was spending some of that time recording an episode with me, and I always feel incredibly selfish to have taken people away from their family on their weekends. But you know what? We had a great conversation, and I'm so grateful that Ben decided to join us because he had amazing ideas to share. Do make sure you include him in your virtual PLN. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. One last friendly reminder, friends, I encourage you to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of our next episode will be Teach Sustainable Development Goals and my conversation with Martha Bongiorno. I hope you will tune in.